Have I got some things for you. Now, who remembers what the Torah portion is today? Metzora has to do with a leper, leprosy, this kind of thing. But the main thing to know is in the Bible, in the Torah, when it talks about leprosy, it's not talking at all about Hansen's disease or the leprosy that we know of. This biblical leprosy is an internal problem, a spiritual problem that gets manifested in the flesh, okay? But before we begin this, I just want to show you how wonderful and smart your dad was. I have here this globe and a satellite. How many of you are smart enough, smart enough you can put a satellite together into space? I know how to use my cell phone, how in the world I can talk to someone in India through all this space. I have no clue. I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a scientist. But I do like math and I do like science. How much math do you think you need to know to put a satellite like that? I mean, a lot of science and a lot of math. Well, I want you to know that God, your father, is the master mathematician. All the smartest math majors in the world are like a little P, okay, compared to the knowledge that your dad has. And when he wrote the Torah, he, how do you know he had it all together? Okay, when he created the universe, can you imagine to create all this galaxies? I don't know if you knew this, but they say every star, every planet is in an exact mathematical position, if it moved even a mile, everything would be chaos. It's all precise. So I want to take some basic math and just show you something that is amazing before we start. Okay. The word three squared means three times three, right? Or three, two times. And what is three times three? Good. Now, let's take the number two cubed means two times two times two, or two three times. Well, what is that? Eight. Okay, so I'm talking about squares and cubes. Now, if you, there's no number between eight and nine, no whole number between eight and nine. Is there anywhere in all of the infinite math a number that will fit exactly between a square and a cube. Is there any number that will fit where you have a square and then you have a number and then you have a cube? Get a load of, who said that? Oh, you <laughs> cheater. You are a cheater. Okay, well, let me show you an example. Okay, what is five squared is five times five, which is what? Okay, and four cubed is four times four, which is 16 times four, which is 64. But look at the separation between these numbers. See how far it is. So anywhere is there two numbers where one's a square and one's a cube, and there's one number in between. I will show you, but first, but wait, there's more. Genesis 1, 1, God said, let there be what? And there was light. Now, when you read it in the Hebrew, you have va-yomer. The vav is end. Yomer is speak or to say. And said, what's this word? Elohim, God, Elohim. And God said, yeah, he or, which means really light exists, be light and light was. And then it goes on to say the yeah, he or, see, yeah, he or, and yeah, he or, there was light. Does everyone see that? Now, let me show you something cool. Cool. When you add up the numerical values of each letter, the Aleph is one, it's the first letter. The Vav is six, it's the sixth letter. And the race is 20, because it's the 20th letter. There's 22 letters, Rashin Tov. 
Now we come over to, that is 27, right? 20 plus 6 plus 1. Or, light is 27. Yahi, the yod are tens, and the he is vav, that is 25. Well, what number is in the middle is 26, and 26, okay, the 25 is 5 squared, the 27 is 3 cubed, this then is the message which you've heard of him and declared to you that God is what? Light, and in him is no darkness, and guess what? The numerical value of the yud he vav he is 26. So the yud heh vav is 26, and it, that is the only number that will go directly between a square and a cube, which numerical value means let there be light. And God is light. The, the, this is why you know the Torah isn't some just made up thing by some human being. Okay? But isn't that amazing? So with that said, <coughs> let's start with Metzora or the leper. Let's look at Leviticus 14, 1 through 4 in your notes. The Lord tells Moses, this is the law of the leper in the day of his what? Cleansing. Now, you can't be cleansed until you are healed, okay? And this doesn't say the law in the day of his healing. It's the law that pertains to his cleansing. He's to be brought to the priest, but guess what? They only bring him to the border. And then the priest has to go out of the border because the leper can't come into the camp. And so it says uh, the priest is then to do what? Examine him. Remember last week? We know the priest is to, it says like 20 times, examine him, make sure. And then if the plague of leprosy is healed, if he's healed, then what happens? And the priest will command them to take for him who is to be cleansed Two living clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. So here's uh, all the things that they need. Plus, they have to have living water at the same time. So the priest goes out to the leper. But here's what you have to notice. This ritual doesn't heal him. This ritual only cleanses him after he's healed. So how does the leper get healed? He has to change his ways. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. And what is leprosy caused by? Evil speech. Lashon hara. Evil speech. Okay. Look at Leviticus 14, 5, and 6 now. So if he's healed, the priest has to command that one of the birds, of these two birds, and they have to be clean birds, Okay, it has to be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. So they'll take one of these birds, they'll put them in a vessel over living water, and they'll kill the bird until you have a blood and water mixture. All right, and then what does it say in 7 and 8? He's to sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times. And did you know? Uh, in Revelation, as well as uh, uh, in Leviticus and Yom Kippur, the blood is sprinkled seven times. And then pronounce them clean. And then the living bird, uh, which he also has tied to a cedar stick with hyssop and a scarlet thread, and he takes the living bird and sticks him under the running water. Uh, and then he unties him and lets him fly away. And he freaks out, I'm sure, says, I will never do that again. Okay, and, and then it says, uh, after so, so many days, he comes in uh, and he tarries out uh, of his tent for seven days. Then let's look at Leviticus 14, 11. It says, the priest that makes him clean shall present the man that is to be made clean and those things before the Lord. It has to be done at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation where everybody gets to see what's going on because he's now being welcomed back into the community and everyone will now know he's welcomed back into the community. Then look at verse 14 through 16. The priest takes some of the blood of the trespass offering and the priest will put 
upon the tip of his right ear of him that's to be cleansed and on the thumb of his right hand and upon the great toe of his right foot. And the priest will take some of the log of oil, pour it into the palm of his own left hand. And the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that's in his left hand and will sprinkle the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. So he's got oil over here, sticks his finger in it and seven times sprinkles it toward the Lord. I think that's fascinating. But what we have to understand, none of this is to heal the leper, okay? There's not some topical healing that they can put on to get rid of the leprosy, all right? It's an internal problem. But here's what's bizarre, and this is another proof it's not Hansen's disease, because a house can get leprosy, okay? If evil speech is being done in the house, even the house can have leprosy. And uh, then the house of Israel and Judah has to be cleansed. And one of the things, uh, one of the first horrible things they said about God after coming out of the wilderness, he brought us out to kill us. How horrible for them to say that God only brought us out to kill us. Wow. God says, I brought you out to bring you in, into the promised land. So, Look at this in Leviticus 14, 33 through 40. The Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron saying, when you come into the land of Canaan, which I give you for a possession, and I put the plague of leprosy in a house. Okay, the Hebrew word for plague is nega. Nega. And uh, he says he puts this plague of leprosy in a house. He says, he that owns the house has to come to the priest and he has to use these words. It seems to me there is, as it were, a plague in the house, Kanega, something like a plague. Then the priest will command that they empty the entire house. How many of you would like to have all the neighbors see everything you had in your house when you bring all of your clothes and furniture and everything outside for all the neighbors to see what Especially if you're a hoarder, <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> but can you imagine? You have to clean out your whole house. Now, how many of you would want to go tell the priest if you're not even sure? Knowing that if he does come, you got to take everything out of your house. Now, here's what's fascinating. Look at this. The priest will command to empty the house before the priest goes in to even see the plague. Now, wait a minute. Why, why don't you come in and see if it's the plague before I empty the house and save me all this trouble? No, you got to take everything out. And the reason is, if I go in and I say it is the plague, everything in the house is now considered to be plagued. Oh, great. Okay. And uh, all that is in the house so it doesn't all become unclean, spiritually defiled. And afterward, the priest goes in to see the house and he will look on the plague. And uh, then it goes on and describes it. And then what I have underlined here, if the plague has spread into the walls of the house, the priest will command they take away the stones in which the plague is and they cast them into an unclean place without the city. Oh my goodness. The stones got to be taken down of a house. Well, what's fascinating is that's exactly what happened to the temple. It was broken down, every stone. There was the plague in the house of God because of all the evil speech. Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> but wait, there's more. Did you know sometimes God would put the plague on certain stones in their house? Now, the person in the house can't be so egotistical to say, I know it's the plague. No, it's not the plague until the priest says it's the plague. You don't have the authority to determine that if it's the plague. Okay? But what happens, you take all the stuff out of your house first. Then the priest goes and says, it's the plague. So what do you have to do to those stones? Remove them. Well, guess what? The Canaanites had also had leprosy. And God would do that, and they would remove the stones in their now occupied house, and they'd find golden jewels behind the walls. 
So God purposely would bring the plague into some people's houses, not because of their evil speech, but because of the previous owner's evil speech. And it so happens he puts it on the very stones that was hiding treasure behind it. Fascinating. Okay, and in Leviticus 14, 42, then they are to take other stones and put them in the place of those stones, and he shall take other plaster and plaster the house. Now look at 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves are like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Yeshua HaMashiach. You know what that means? You are a stone in the house of God. Don't you develop leprosy or you will be removed and another stone will be put in your place. Something to think about. We can learn numerous lessons from the statement of the owner of a house that appears to be afflicted with a spiritual defilement. At first, his house is affected. And then what happens? You also want to see your clothing can have leprosy. So it can go to your house. It can jump to your clothing. And then it can jump to you. <clears throat> Rashi had said that even if the owner of the house who notices the signs is even a scholar and he's able to determine with certainty that this is definitely Sa'arat, he still may not state categorically Nega, the plague, has appeared to be in the house, but he has to rather say Kanega, something like a plague. So why dilute the truth? If you know it's the plague, why can't you say it's the plague? Even though it's the truth. The Torah says God, that God says, I am the one who's going to put the plague. And only then is it certainty. Why should the Torah now insist on the words of uncertainty, something like a plague? Well, number one, the Torah is teaching a lesson for us in proper behavior. How many of us come across like we know it all? And then we find out we don't. Have you ever got angry at someone and then you found out it wasn't them that did it anyway? <laughs> you know, we, in other words, we have to speak with reservation, humility, even when the situation looks unequivocally clear. Teach your tongue to say, I don't know. How hard it is for some pastors and teachers to always think they have to know the answer to everything. I'm really happy with, I don't know. You go figure it out and tell me, you know. Number two, since the priest is the only one to determine whether or not the house is unclean, for anyone else to say so would be disrespectful toward the position of the priest. Third, the owner cannot say nega, but only kanega, simply because it's not true. Until the priest proclaims it, it's not that and must not be spoken of as such. Uh, let's see. Uh, the, oh, yeah. Look at that. Okay. One of the interesting things uh, that I have here, like I said, when they bring some, all their stuff out, everyone's going to see that he really did own items that he said he didn't have because he didn't want you to borrow them. You come to them, hey, yeah, can I borrow that? Can I borrow that? No, I don't have it. No, I don't have it. And all of a sudden, he brings everything out. Yes, you did. Liar, liar. Pants on fire. Okay. Uh, he believed that being stingy would protect his wealth. Consequently, he's punished by suffering a big financial loss with the damage to his home and with the embarrassment of being exposed as a dishonest person. All right, let's go to Leviticus 14, verse 43 through 45. If the disease breaks out again in the house, after he's taken out the stones and scraped the house and plastered it, then the priest has to go and look. If the disease has spread in the house, it is a persistent leprous disease in the house. It is unclean. And then he has to tear down the entire house, all the stones and timber and all the plaster of the house, and he carries them out of the city to an unclean place. Can you imagine? Your whole, how many of you have been around someone who is negative constantly? constantly, everything that comes out of their mouth is negative. Run! Okay. Leviticus 14, 49 through 51. Then he's to take, uh, to cleanse the house. Here we go. Two birds, cedar, wood, scarlet, and hyssop. 
He kills one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water. He takes the cedar wood, hyssop, scarlet, living bird, dips them in the blood of the slain bird and in the running water and sprinkles the house how many times? We are the house of God. We're a stone. We're a house. We have to stop our negative speech. We have to, or our stone will have to be replaced. Let's jump to the Hoftor now. That goes with this chapter. It's an interesting story about lepers. In 2 Kings 7, 3 through 4, there were four lepers who were seated at the doorway in the town, and they said one to another, why are we waiting here to die? If we say we'll go into the town and there's no food in the town, we will come to our end in town. But if we go on waiting here, death will come to us. So come, let us give ourselves up to the army of a ram, and if they let us go on living, then life will be ours. And if they put us to death, well, then we'll die. So here, this army is attacking Jerusalem. And as lepers, they can't be in Jerusalem. They're outside and they're stuck in the middle between this army wanting to attack Jerusalem and the people in Jerusalem will kill them if they come in. So they say, what do we do? Ah, let's just go give ourselves up to the enemy. Whatever happens, happens. Well, so what happens? Uh, let's go on. Oh, I've skipped seven, one and two. Uh, here's Elisha. And he says, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a say of fine flour will be sold for a shekel and two say as a barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Then the captain on whose hand the king leaned said to the man of God, oh, if the Lord himself should make the windows into heaven, this couldn't happen. But he said, you're going to see it with your own eyes. But guess what? You're not going to get eat of it. And then we see the story of the lepers. And then what happens in verse five and six, they rose at twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold, nobody was there. For the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sound of chariots and horses, the sound of a great army. So they all said to one another, behold, the king of Israel has hired against us, the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to come against us. So they all fled. And then verse eight, when those lepers came to the outer line of the tents, Let's bring up the lepers coming to the tents. They went into one tent and they had food and drink and they took from it silver and gold and clothing, which it says they put in a secret place. Then they came back and went into another tent from which they took more goods, which they put away in a secret place. And then verse nine and 10, then they said, oh, this isn't the right thing to do. Today is the day of good news. And if we say nothing, if we go on waiting here till the morning, we're gonna get a spanking. We're going to get punished. They said, so let us go and give the news to those of the king's house. So here they're still lepers. They're putting their life on the line by going to the king's house of all people. You get the king lepers off with your head, you know. And uh, so they came in and crying out to the doorkeepers of the town, they gave them the news and said, we came to the tents of the Aramanians. And there was no one there and no voice of a man, only the horses and asses and their tents as they were. So in verse 11 and 12, the gatekeepers called out and it was told within the king's house. And the king rose in the night and said to his servants, I'll tell you what the servants have done. They know that we're hungry. Therefore, they've gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the open country, thinking when we come out of the city, we'll take them alive and get into the city. So all, what is this? You know, is this fake news or is this real news? And so they took two horsemen. And the king sent them after the army of the Syrians saying, go check it out. So they went out after them as far as the Jordan and behold, the whole way was littered with garments and equipment that the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king. And then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Syrians. And so therefore, one say of flying flour was sold for a shekel and two of uh, sayers of a barley for a shekel, according to exactly what the Lord said. And then verse 18, so the words of the man of God came true, which he said to the king, two measures of barley will be offered for the price of a shekel, a measure of good meal for a shekel tomorrow about this time in the marketplace of Samaria. So the captain had answered the man of God. If the Lord should make windows in heaven, could such a thing happen? And he said, you'll see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat of it. And so it happened for the people trampled him in the gate and he died. This is why we have to trust the Lord. It's that simple. Uh, if God says something, 
you know it is true and he can make it happen. He has the power to make it happen and only him. So with that said, let's stand. And uh, we'll close in prayer and then you can go downstairs by the elevator where we have all kinds of coffee and snacks and then come back up. We'll have a little bit of time of worship and then we'll go into the second portion. Oh, tomorrow, five o'clock is when the Seder is, but the doors open at 415. Okay, so you can come in at 415. All right. Let's pray. Avinu Malkeinu, Father King, we just thank you so much for your word because we know your word is true. You are light and there is no darkness within you whatsoever. And Father, we want to put all of our trust in you. We don't want to trust in man. We don't want to trust in horses and chariots. We want to trust in the name of the Lord, our God. So I pray right now, Father, even as this Passover weekend, their week, of unleavened bread is about to start. We pray that you get all the leaven out of our house. We do not want to become a leper stone. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord, our God. Amen. Take a break. Okay, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the New Testament. Are you ready to go digging deeper? Yeah. Okay, well, here's something I want everyone to pay close attention to. How many of you know perspective is very important? A dozen people can see the same thing and all come away with different answers, be it a crime scene, be it whatever it was. But I'm going to give you a good example of how perspective is everything. I'm going to show you a picture right here really quick, and then I'm going to cover it. And I want you to tell me what you saw. Are you ready? It's going to go fast. Did it, did, it, did it look like Jesus at all? Well, here we go. Take a look. I'm going to bring it in closer. There's a lady and another lady and a semi and a parking lot and some vegetables. You can, but you can also see Jesus' face there. But you can all see it's really a couple of women standing with a semi in the background. Okay. Well, what's, uh, some people can't see it. Okay, let me, let me, let me do something here. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump out of here and let me do this. Do you, do you see the two ladies? And there's a semi in a parking lot, and there's some, like, beans. But even like this, you can, is it Jesus, or is this people in a parking lot? If you can't see it, come to the center, or look head on, and you'll see it, if you don't see it. But isn't that amazing how that works? So anyway, there, see it now? Okay, so now, what's fun about the Bible, well, I, I don't know how many of you are as old as me, but it, pocket knife was a pocket knife. And then all of a sudden, out could come a spoon and a fork and fingernail clippers, I mean, everything. It's like, oh, I didn't know a knife could do that. Too many people see the Bible as just a single knife they don't realize all of the different things that can come out of it. And so that's one of the things I'm trying to say when it comes to perspective. When you're reading the Bible, you can, I like to say, how do you know water, the word of God is compared to water, right? That the word of the Lord be filled 
the earth like the oceans, you know, cover the earth. Well, the amazing thing is the word of God is on different levels. What relation do you want to have to the ocean? Let's say the word of God is the ocean. Some people want to stay on the beach and dip their toes in it. Other people may want to swim. Some may want to go out in a boat. Some may want to snorkel. Some may want to scuba dive. You're all in the water, but you have a different relationship to the water. And we need to understand the word of God when it comes to understanding there's all levels of understanding. Just like if you go out and scuba dive, you see the coral reefs and all the beauty underneath, but you don't see it when you're above ground. So when we're jumping into the Torah today, we're going to be scuba diving. Okay? Now, the people that don't see it, I, mean, well, I don't see that. Well, get on your scuba gear. You know, I'm going to show you things in the Word. Well, I didn't know the Word could do that. Or I didn't know that was there. So we're going to put on some scuba gear today. And it's going to change your perspective. How many of you have ever seen a verse and you never saw something before and all of a sudden there it was? You know what I'm talking about. Okay. Well, Luke 21, 25. Yeshua is saying there will be signs. And where are the signs going to be? In the sun. In the moon and in the stars, that's referring to like comets, you know, things like that. There's going to be signs. Well, if he says there's going to be signs, what does that mean? There's going to be signs. This isn't difficult. Now, I'll read Luke 21, 25, 28. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations in perplexity. They're going to be all confused. Because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. And I think that has to do with these giant earthquakes and tsunamis coming and things like that. People are going to be fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. It says the powers of the heavens, not just the powers on earth, but the powers of heaven are going to be shaken. And then they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? How many of you want to be here to see that? Well, when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Okay, we're going to talk about the Son of Man coming in the clouds in just a little bit. But I want to start with Genesis 1.1. This here is a picture of Genesis 1-1. It says the earth was waste and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters. It's just totally dark, totally void. It says in Hebrew, tohu and bohu. It's just horrible. And then look at verse three through five. God said, yehi or, say that. Yehi or, that's let there be light. Say it again. Yehi or, the Yehi or, and there was light. And God saw the light and he said, it is good. And so God divided the light from the darkness. You following me? So here we go. Boom. He divided the light from the darkness. There's no sun and moon yet. He divided light from darkness. You know what this means? This is total light. This is total darkness. There are no stars. There are no moon. It is completely black. It wasn't like the sun was rotating around the earth or anything. It's just light and darkness, and he divided it. Amazing. And look at this. At this stage... God called the light day, and he called the darkness what? And there is no darkness in God. God is only light. So I want to now change your perspective. I want you to think of truth and lies, good and evil. Think of moral, moral light and moral darkness. 
there's different Hebrew words for darkness. There's like hosek. Okay, there can be a word that just means darkness physically, but there's also moral darkness. Okay? And Genesis 1.19 says there was evening and morning and there was a what day? And what happened on the fourth day? He created the sun, the moon, and the stars. So what does that mean? There were, the first three days were days of total darkness. On the night side, there was no light. There was no morality for three days of total darkness. And how many days of darkness was there in the Exodus plagues? Three days of darkness. It is recreating the Genesis story. The Exodus story is recreating the Genesis story. And in Egypt, immorality, there's three days of darkness. But even in the darkness, it said Israel had what? And that refers to the moon and the stars. So think of it not only physically, but morally. Israel was to be a light among the dark nations. You following me? Children of Abraham are like the stars of heaven, which means they are light in the total darkness. Look at Exodus 10, 22 and 23. Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the Egypt for how many days? Three days. They didn't see one another. They didn't rise from their place for three days. But all the children have light in their dwellings. So think of the darkness in Genesis for three whole days. But then in the fourth day, what do we find? Genesis 1.14. Now I'm going to bring in. He makes the sun, the moon, and the stars. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to do what? Again, he divides light from darkness. Now again, he's making a division. And he says to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs, seasons, days, and years. Now, what that means is I want a division of time. <laughs> exactly. It's a division of time. Time. Who's going to be on my calendar and who's not going to be on my calendar? Moral darkness, moral light. Now, here there's a command in Genesis that there be lights in the time of darkness so we will have a light source and a way for communication through God's calendar of lights. God created these for see the stars, the sun, the moon, for signs, and for his calendar as a way to communicate with his people when we live in a world of darkness. So right here, he's saying, get on my calendar in Genesis. That is going to be your light source. And that will be how I can communicate with you. Imagine pitch black and people have flashlights and they're flashing them off and on in Morse code or whatever. They're communicating. Well, look at Exodus 12, 1 and 2. The Lord told Moses and Aaron, the land of Egypt, where are they? In Egypt, which is what? Darkness. And what does he say? This month is to be the beginning of months, and it will be the first month of the year for you. The very first commandment that God gave Israel was in the land of darkness, and he said, get on my calendar. The first command is, get on my calendar, because this is where I'm going, and I'm the God of light, and so I give you lights, the sun and the moon, so you can follow me. And these are your pointed dates. Exactly. Yeshua was a light in the world, a place full of darkness and sin, which goes back to the very first light, was the light of the Torah, before there was the sun and the moon. 
Now look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 through 7. But you, brethren, are not in what? Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's go back. I got to go back. Oh, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Okay. You, brethren, are not where? You're not in darkness. Okay. That, that day should overtake you as a thief, for you are all sons of what? Light. And he called the light day, and he called the darkness night. And he says, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. So don't let us sleep as do the rest, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that are drunken are drunken in the night. This is talking about morally. Okay. So we have to understand. He's saying, you're going to know if you're on my calendar. Wow. What a concept. Now, so let me back, get back to here. Okay. Genesis 1.14. He put lights in the firmament to do what? Divide. God is into dividing all the time. And here we see there was evening and morning, a fourth day. So what do we find? As it says in Proverbs 6.23, your Torah is the what? When you see the sun and the moon and the stars, you think, that's God's instruction. It's the Torah. God's trying to communicate with us. Okay. Now, here's what's fascinating. How many of you heard of the Ponds Brook Comet? Okay. A while ago, it was in the constellation Draco, which means the dragon. It orbits the sun every 71 years. It will next get closest to the sun on April 21st, Shazam, which is era Pesach. Now, Draco is this constellation that is like snaking or serpent its way through. I don't know if you can read that. It says Draco. But Draco, despite its size and designation as the eighth largest constellation, Draco, the dragon constellation, is not especially prominent. The name is derived from the Latin term Dracona, meaning a huge serpent. <laughs> Satan is called the dragon. He's called the huge serpent. And here, now, this devil comet is going to be appearing on Passover. If you, as you can see it, it's closest to the sun. But let me bring this up. Right, let me see where I'm at. Okay. Here we are on the 20th, right? Okay. Here is the 13th of Nisan. This is the 14th of Nisan. And the 14th of Nisan is when you have Passover. So I have Arab Pesach, Pesach 1, 2 going through. Next week, right here, the 27th, okay? Everyone see that? I want to point something out now in your Bible. Look at Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Daniel sees in the night visions. Behold, with the clouds of heaven, there was one coming like the son of man. Where did we hear that before? <laughs> we just got done reading the verse in Luke. Okay. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is everlasting. It won't pass away. His kingdom, one that will never be destroyed. Well, now let's jump to Revelation. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. So Daniel is talking about the book of Revelations. Or I should say Revelations is talking about the book of Daniel, if you get it in the right order. But now we're going to jump to Daniel chapter 10 and verse 2 through 4. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for how many weeks? Three. Which is how many days? 21 days. He ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. And then it says, on the 24th day of the first month, I was standing on the bank of the great river Tigris. Okay, is the first month January? No. no. All right. Now, right here, 
is the 24th of Nisan. Do you see that? This, partic- this year, April of 2024, down here is the 24th of Nisan. This is the day the angel appears to Daniel. And what do we see? In Daniel 10, 12 through 14. Then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the very first day that you set your heart to understand and humble yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have become, beca- and I've come because of your words. Okay, if it was the 24th day, and it's been three weeks, you go back three weeks, what's 24 minus 21? Three, and it's the third of Nisan. So on the third of Nisan is when Daniel started praying and he prayed for three whole weeks and the messenger comes and says, I've heard your words from three weeks ago, but I've been busy. Okay, so let's look and see what happens. Daniel 10, 20, he said, also, do you know? Oh no, Daniel 10, 12 through 14. Sorry, skipped it. Daniel 10, 12 through 14. And he said to me, don't be afraid, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humble yourself before God, your words have been heard, and I've come because of those words. And he said, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, that's Michael the archangel who's over Israel, one of the chief princes came to help me, for I was left with the three kings of Persia, three kings, these three people in charge of Iran. And came to make you understand what has happened to your people when? In this time that we're in now. So Daniel 10 is a vision of the day that we are in. You following me? For the vision is for days yet to come. Well, it's been about 2,400 years. So it has been for days, 1,000 years. As the day, it's been two days. And then Daniel 10 verse 20, then he says, do you know why he came to you? Well, guess what? Now I'm going to return to fight against the prince of Persia. And in verse 21, he says, I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is no one who contends by my side against you except Michael, your prince. Well, guess what happens in the book of Revelation? Most people don't connect these dots. The book of Revelation 12 is referring to the warfare in Daniel 10. Look what it says. There are a war arose in heaven. And Michael and his angels were fighting against who? The dragon. Okay, so there's a war going on in heaven that Daniel saw the vision of. This is the war he saw where he's fighting the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. There was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient what? Serpent. Serpent. Who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world? He was thrown down where? To the earth. And his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accused them day and night before God. Okay? Now, let me point this out. Here, I ran. Just got done attacking Israel. For us, it was on Saturday, but they're a day ahead. It was on Sunday. As a matter of fact, it says right here in this new settlement, as the dust settled in the aftermath of Sunday morning's Iranian attack on Israel, which was fended off by all these people. And uh, Bibi told Netanyahu, don't strike back. Just take the win. Be happy that 300 missiles were shot at you and you shot them down. But I wanted to point out that it was really on Sunday. Saturday here, Sunday there. Now, here is the 24th of Nisan. And on the 24th of Nisan is when the messenger appeared saying he was trying to get there earlier, right? Well, look at this. The Iranian foreign minister, uh, Wuha Wuha, confirmed this on Sunday saying that Iran gave neighboring countries and the United States 72 hours notice that it would launch the attack. Now, of course, everyone is denying that. The United States is denying that. How many of you know you can't trust either side in the media? That's 
You're going to hear stuff. And this is what is so scary. We wonder how in the world could we be deceived? If we emotionally go after the first thing we hear and we don't stop and wait to hear from the other side, there's so, matter of fact, I've seen news reports that Biden not only knew three days before, but Biden talked to Iran and said, you can go ahead and bomb them as long as you keep it small. Now, do we believe that? Who knows? I mean, every, I'm telling you, politically, people are going to run that way and say, what, Biden even knew of the attack and he let them attack knowing that we could shoot him down? Or do you say what he says? No, we don't know anything. You can't jump on either side. That's the problem. Emotionally, we get so attached to one particular side. And guess what? There's liars in politics on every side. That's why I like to stick with what God says. Okay. Well, 72 hours, do you know, 72 hour warning, if that is true, 24, 48, 72 hours, the third of Nisan, which is the very day Daniel started praying because of a war coming with Iran. Right there. This is the very day Daniel started praying and this is why I wrote in my book that I knew Iran, who's never attacked Israel, was going to attack in the month of Nisan. It's because of Daniel 10. But do you know what that is telling us, especially when we see it started here? We are right now living in Daniel's prophecy of chapter 10. Satan is just being cast down from heaven. The constant that comet. I believe at this very moment there's been a war in heaven. The devil and his angels are being cast down right now. We are living in the prophecy of Daniel. And it says here, there's this battle going between the bad guys. And here comes Michael. You're a prince. All of this is happening in the month of Nisan right now. Okay. I just want you guys to begin to wrap your head. We are living in the prophetic fulfillment of Daniel chapter 10. Okay. Just thought I'd add that this morning. So now let's go on to the rest of the story. Let's go to Acts 3, chapter 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. What time is the ninth hour? Three in the afternoon. And did you know this translation is wrong? This is what's horrible with English. It was not the hour of prayer. Do you know what it was? Look at the next verse. Peter and John were going up at the same time to the temple at the hour of the prayer. It wasn't any prayer. It was, it was the Amidah, the standing prayer. Who here has never heard of the Amidah? Just so I know. Okay. This is why you have to understand when you're reading the book of Acts, there is a prayer. Hey, well, someone go grab me an Amidah downstairs or bring it up for me, if you could, somebody. Okay. The Amidah was written 2,400 years ago by Ezra, Nehemiah, the Sanhedrin. And it was said three times a day. Three times a day. Now, the amazing thing about this prayer, it is like 2,500 years old. And Jesus said this prayer three times every day his whole life. Every day, his whole life, Jesus said this prayer. Amidah in English means to stand. So this was known as the standing prayer. Isn't that cool? Now, let me point something out about this. Here, it's at the hour of the prayer. So it's three in the afternoon. This is the prayer they were praying 2,000 years ago called the standing prayer. 
And let's look at what happens in Acts 3, verse 1 and 2. Okay. And a certain man who was lame from birth was carried, whom they laid every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, and he's asking for alms of those who entered the temple. All right? So every day they laid this man who hasn't been able to walk from birth. Well, look at Acts 4.22. The man was over 40 years old of whom this miracle of healing was shown. In the Amidah, that this man prayed three times a day his entire life, there's a prayer for healing. Three times a day for 40 years, he's praying, God, heal me. I want to stand for the standing prayer. I've never been able to stand. I'm lame. And so what does God do at the time of standing prayer? He gets healed and it says, guess what, everybody? He stood. But no Christians get the concept that he stood during the standing prayer. Now, follow this. The other thing, he was over 40 years old. Yeshua was 33 when he died. Which means Yeshua's entire life, he walked by this guy who was laying at the eastern gate saying hi, and he went in and never healed him. Every time Yeshua walked through the eastern gate to go in the temple, this guy was laying there asking to be healed, and he never healed him. He wanted him to be healed at the right time. And like the 40 years of wandering, here he's 40 years, he's about to leave his wilderness, and he's going to get healed at the standing prayer. I'm going to read the prayer for healing that is in here that they prayed. And imagine this guy for 40 years, three times a day praying this. Heal us, O Lord, and we will be healed. Save us, and we will be saved. You are our praise. O grant a perfect healing to all of our ailments for you, Almighty King, our faithful and merciful healer. Blessed are you, O Lord, the healer of the sick of his people, Israel. He prayed that three times a day, 40 years. And then what happens? Okay. Acts 3, 6 through 9. What did, he's asking for alms. And Peter says, Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, get up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up, what did he do? He stood. And guess what? He's walking. And he enters with him into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And everyone saw him walking and leaping. They knew this was the guy. But now all of a sudden, when you see it's, tied to Judaism, okay, well, here, this was the very hour of prayer that they were saying right before the Spirit of God fell on Pentecost. Remember? It's the third hour of the day. It was nine in the morning. That's the other time they prayed the Amidah. And look at this. Mark, let's go back to Mark 11. Verse 25, no one sees this. No Christians see this. It says, when you stand praying, what are they doing? Well, they're doing the Amidah three times a day. When you say, the, this could be saying, when you say the Amidah, or when you stand and pray, what are you supposed to do? Forgive. And guess what? There's a prayer for forgiveness in the Amidah. Here's how it goes. Forgive us, our Father, for we have sinned. Pardon us, our King, for we have transgressed. You pardon and forgive. Blessed are you, O Lord, who is merciful and always ready to forgive. So look, do what you're reading, he's saying. When you stand and pray for your forgiveness, you go be forgive other people. But it all is tied again to this prayer, the Amidah. And remember, this was written hundreds of years before Messiah was ever born. Now, along that same line, in this prayer, the first prayer is called the God of history. And the next prayer is called the God of nature. And listen to this. Remember when they were in the upper room and then all of a sudden Yeshua appeared to them? This is what they were praying in the upper room. Now, listen to this 
They're little, there's 18 little short prayers, and it teaches us how to enter God's presence. We don't enter God's presence, oh, please, God, give me this, give me this, and give me this. You enter God with thanksgiving, or you praise, you're praising him. You're wonderful, and then you're thanking him, okay? But anyway, listen to, I want you to understand, this is what the disciples were praying when Yeshua appeared. You, O Lord, are mighty forever. You revive the dead. Now, Yeshua's in the grave for three days. Three times a day for those three days, they're praying, you revive the dead. Bring Jesus back, okay? And you have the power to save. You sustain the living with loving kindness. You revive the dead with great mercy. You support the falling. You heal the sick. You set free the bound and keep faith with those who are sleeping in the dust. Who is like you, O doer of mighty acts? Who resembles you, a king who puts to death? and restores to life, and causes salvation to flourish, you are certain to revive the dead. Blessed are you, Lord, who revives the dead. Three times a day they're praying to revive Jesus. Now, you want to know what's really crazy? Where it says here, who resembles you, a king who puts to death, restores to life, and causes salvation to flourish. What's the Hebrew word for salvation? Yeshua, and to flourish means resurrect. Three times a day they're praying, who causes Yeshua to resurrect? They're saying that three times a day for three days, and all of a sudden they're, they've been singing in Hebrew their whole life and never made the connection. And now all of a sudden they're making the connection, we're praying for Yeshua to resurrect, and this is what we're praying. We never even understood that. And as they're praying that, he comes in and says, hey, howdy, guys. What's up? But that's what is incredible. We give these prayers away that are 2,500 years old. And remember, Jesus prayed this three times a day his whole life. Anyway, I wanted to bring that up. Okay, and then look at John 20, 19 through 21. Here they were. Then the same day at evening, okay, being the first day of the week, okay, that's Sunday around 3 p.m. That's when evening is. It's the time of the prayer. Okay, right there it tells you. When the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst and said unto them, what? Peace. Peace be unto you. And when he said this, he showed unto them his hands in his side, and the disciples were glad, and they saw the Lord. And Yeshua said again to them, Peace, as my Father has sent me, even so I send you. Well, guess what? And here's a prayer for peace. And I just get done praying for peace. And it goes, grant welfare, grant peace, welfare, blessing, grace, loving kindness, and mercy to us, to all Israel, your people. Bless us, our Father, one and all, with the light of your countenance. For by the light of your countenance, think of the priestly blessing. By the light of your countenance, you have given us, O Lord our God, a Torah of life, not death, life, loving kindness, salvation, blessing, mercy, life, and peace. May it please you to bless your people as at all times and in every hour with your peace. And what does he do? He comes and says, peace be with you. All of this is tied into this prayer. They were praying three times a day. And so here they are. I have a picture of the temple. They're all there. Everyone. Now that's the Western Wall, but it's the, the temple from 2000 years ago was there. But it says in John 20, 26 to 28, after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas comes with them and then came Jesus and the door was shut and he stood in their midst. And what did he say? Peace be to you. And then he says to Thomas, reach here your finger and behold my hands and reach here your hand and thrust it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believing. And what does Thomas say? You are my Lord and my God. Wow. Well, guess what? Who can tell me this word? The Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey, which is Yahweh in Hebrew. Okay. That refers to the Lord. Now, just like you have different fonts on your computer, Hebrew has had different fonts throughout history. Here's 
how Moses wrote that name in the original Torah scrolls. The Yod or the Yud means hand. The Vav is a, like a nail connecting things. And the letter He means behold. And it was a person standing there going, behold. And it's called the letter He, behold. Now, what happens? He said, I won't believe until I see the nailed hands. And Yeshua goes, he raises his hand and shows him the nails and says, behold, I am the yud Vave. I am the Lord your God. And that's why Thomas says that. He sees that he is the yud Vave, the hand and the nail being revealed. And that's the first thing Yeshua says is, behold, Hinei. Okay, so now we'll go to something else. Let's go to Acts 15, 19 through 21. This also is extremely misunderstood by Christians. Uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary. No, no, Peter, Paul, and Andrew. <laughs> you know, here they were. Paul comes to Peter and... You know, they're all trying to figure out what they're going to do. And he goes, therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the nations who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him for his read every Sabbath in the synagogues. So Christians say, well, see, that's all we have to do. That's all we have to do. We don't have to do anything else. We just have, well, what about thou shalt not kill? What about thou shalt not steal? This had nothing, absolutely nothing to do for salvation. What this had to do with is to allowing them in the synagogue. He says there has to be boundaries. Before we even allow them to come into the synagogue, we got to make sure that they ain't fornicating down at the pagan temple before they come. This wasn't a qualification for salvation. This was a qualification to come into the synagogue. And then they said when they get into the synagogue, they're going to hear Moses read every Sabbath. Okay, so they see that there's a lot in the Torah. The Gentiles know nothing. Okay, and how do you eat an elephant? You no, you don't. It's not kosher. <laughs> but it's the concept. They're saying... Let's, let's not make them eat the whole enchilada. Let's give them little bits and they'll learn as they grow. And this is an important principle. Every one of us is on a different walk. When they were all commanded to go to Jerusalem, all the Jews from every nation and Acts, that's why they were Jews from every nation. They were commanded to be there. But those that are walking from Egypt to Jerusalem don't walk the same path as those from Lebanon or Syria or Iraq. They're all on a different path. And even those who are on the same path, some are just leaving Egypt while the others left three weeks earlier. And they're a lot further up the path to Jerusalem. We are not to expect each other to walk our path. We have to find out what path they're on and encourage them where they're at. And that's the problem. Too often we force everybody to walk where we're at. No, that's not the case. You have to find out where they're coming from and then you can tell them where they're going. But you, want to, you have to know where they're coming from first. You can't just automatically put this judgment. You have to do this and do this and do that. It's like, who cares? You know, I'll have a, you know, there's a, a lot of the messy annex, I like to say, who are more like Torah tyrants all right. And it's like, you can't do this. You can't do that. Hey, this person could be being abused by their spouse. They could care less. You need to figure out where they're coming from before you start throwing all this crap on them. Okay, moving on. Uh, Acts 15, 28. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements that you abstain from these things. If you keep yourself from these, you're, you'll do well, fairly well. So in other words, let's give them a starting point, okay? At least stop visiting the pagan temples, come to synagogue, and you'll learn. And then Acts 21, 17 through 22, what happens? 
when we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James. All the elders are present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had been doing among the Gentiles through his ministry. See, they had been only ministering to the Jews. Paul's ministering to the Gentiles. And when they heard it, they glorified God. But look what they said to him. You see, brother, how many thousands, and that's not the correct English word, it's tens of thousands. Okay, it's the word myriad, where we get the word myriad from. Are, are among the Jews, of those who have believed, they are all zealous for the law. Tens of thousands of Jews, they didn't throw out the law. They're zealous for the law. And it says, they've been told about you that you teach all the Jews from among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They're certainly going to hear that you have come. Okay, if that was true, then Paul wasn't following Torah. But Paul says that is not true. That's not what I do, which is why he had Timothy circumcised and these other people. But look at this. Acts 21, 23, and 24. They say, do therefore what we tell you we have four men who are under a vow. These are a Nazarite vow. And take these men and purify yourselves along with them and pay their expenses. Paul was under a Nazarite vow, which is why he had to go to Jerusalem so that they may shave their heads. Thus, everyone will know that there's nothing in what they've been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance to the Torah. And Paul goes, yes, I do follow the Torah. Yes, I'm under a Nazarite vow. Yes, I'll pay all their expenses. And it was a lot of money. And then look at verse 25 and 26. And then he says, and right after this, he's saying, look, you're following the Torah. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we send a letter with our judgment. They should abstain from these kind of things. And then Paul took the men. And the next day he did purify himself along with them, went into the temple, uh, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. Okay, so you have to understand this. This happened maybe 30 years after Messiah died, 20 years. And the believers are still in the temple every day, every day. And they're doing sacrifices every day. The only reason they stopped was the temple got destroyed. There's nothing wrong with doing sacrifices when you understand 99% of sacrifices weren't for sin. And then lastly, the last verse, Acts 17, verse 10 through 12. Trouble in Greece. And the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the Bereans? Who, the Bereans are the ones that studied to show themselves approved, right? Now, when most Christians tell, talk about the Bereans, they think they were Gentiles. No, look what it says. They arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily. And it wasn't a Gideon Bible they were examining to see if these things were so. Many of them, therefore, believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. So the Greek women, the Greek men are in the synagogue on Shabbat learning Torah. Here is not a picture of the Bereans. These were not the Bereans. This would be a better picture of the Bereans. And what were they doing? They were looking at the Torah to see if what Paul was saying was true according to the Torah. Right. Do we get a better idea now? Okay, let's stand. And we'll close with prayer. <clears throat>